Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Arbuckle, and I'm a director from the Ontario Library Association and chair of the Book and Periodical Council, and a close personal friend of tonight's celebrated author. On behalf of Jay Miller and Hazel Miller, co-publishers at Bookhug Press, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the launch of Letters to Amelia by Lindsay Ziervogel. This launch event is part of Toronto Lit Up program, which is designed to spotlight new works and empower Toronto's writers. Toronto Lit Up is funded by the Toronto Arts Council and spearheaded by the Toronto International Festival of Authors. Before we begin tonight, we would like to acknowledge that the land you are joining from this evening has been uh, for thousands of years has been the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is still home to many diverse Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live, gather, work, and learn on this land. We also acknowledge that many of you in the virtual audience are joining from other locations. We encourage anyone who wishes to do so to please share an acknowledgement of where you are joining us from in the chat function found on the bottom of your screen. If you're unsure of the history of the land under your feet, I highly recommend the online resource native-land.ca to learn more about the land you inhabit, the history of those lands, and how to actively be better part of a future going forward. Jay and Hazel Miller, co-publishers from Book Hug Press, have had a sudden family emergency tonight and unfortunately are not able to be here with us, but our thoughts are with them and their family and we hope they're all taking good care. They did send a note saying that they are so excited for the first launch of the fall season at Book Hug Press and they're so happy that it is to celebrate the release of Lindsay's highly anticipated debut novel. In the long lead up tonight, we had of course hoped that we might be able to gather in person by the fall. Oh, we had so many hopes, but no less, we're so thankful to gather with all of you in this virtual space to celebrate Lindsay and her beautiful, beautiful book. Before we get underway tonight, we just wanted to go over a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, live closed captions are available and to access the captions, you should be able to click on the CC function button, which appears on the bottom of your screen and follow those prompts. Secondly, of course, the event tonight is being recorded and will be available on demand viewing on the YouTube channel in the next few coming days. If you haven't already purchased a copy of Letters to Amelia, what are you doing? Um, you may wish to order a copy or several copies directly from the website bookhugpress.ca. As a special bonus, we have copies signed by the lovely author herself. And for anyone in attendance who orders tonight and gets a copy, you will get an autographed copy for yourself. So that's great. Uh, we'll drop a link to the book's product page on the, from the website into the chat function. Alternatively, of course, you are most welcome to purchase a copy from your local independent bookseller. In fact, on the book's product page on the website, you'll see a button that allows you to check stock at your local indie bookstores. I personally am so happy to be here to celebrate our guest of honor, Lindsay, and the incredible accomplishment of this, her debut novel, Letters to Amelia. I first met Lindsay through our Unbook Club. It is a book club, but it's Unbook Club because we don't all read the same book. Where it's a group where we get together, we talk about books, we each bring a pile, and, uh, and we talk about which books we want to recommend to each other. But we also unpack the challenges that we're going through, whether with work or with motherhood or with our own creative projects. And Lindsay posted the other day a picture actually of her working on this novel alongside a photo of a very freshly born baby, her youngest baby, Claire. Um, and it's really just been incredible to watch the progression, the growth of both her human baby and her book baby. And it's not lost on me that this past week has been a pretty massive emptying of the nest for Lindsay as her little human goes off to start JK and her book gets sent out into the world to be read and celebrated and loved by everyone who reads it. The main character in Lindsay's novel is Grace Porter. She is a library technician at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. As I mentioned before, I am a library person and I'm here to tell you that if you want the library to recommend your book and love your book, we have a price, it's not big, please write about us. 
and let us have adventures and let us hate our work, but also be completely consumed by it. And also let us have sex, please. Because if you do, we will demand that everyone we know in library land read your book immediately and love it as much as we do. So on behalf of all of library land, um, and particularly on behalf of library technicians, I would like to thank Lindsay for representing us so well on the page and for never ever asking Grace to put her hair into a bun. Thank you. Now, we are almost ready to bring out our guest of honor, but first, let me tell you about what you can expect over the next hour. Tonight's event, event will include a reading from Letters to Amelia by very special guest, Danny Kind, and also an interview with Lindsay, which will be moderated by Angela Antle, who is joining us tonight from Newfoundland. And there will be time at the end of that interview to answer questions. So please use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the screen to ask your question. And you can start thinking now about what type of question you would like to pose to Lindsay. And now I would finally like to introduce Lindsay Zervogel. She is a Toronto-based writer and the, an arts educator and the creator of the internationally acclaimed Love Lettering Project. After studying contemporary dance, she received her MA in Creative Writing from the University of Toronto. Her writing has been widely published in Canada and in the UK. And since 2001, she's been teaching creative writing workshops in schools and communities. Her hand-bound books are housed in the permanent collection at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library also a star location in the book. Um, she's the creator of the Love Lettering Project. And Lindsay has asked people all over the world to write love letters to their communities and hide them for strangers, spreading place-based love wherever she goes. Because of the Love Lettering Project, CBC Radio has deemed Lindsay a national treasure. And Letters to Amelia is her first book. So please join me in welcoming my friend, our national treasure, the effervescent Lindsay Zervogel. Thank you. And I'm not sure I didn't bring a hanky, which my Nana Ruth would be rolling her eyes right now because she knows you always need a hanky. And I do not have one. And I did not wear waterproof makeup. But thank you. That was very kind. Thank you, everyone, so much for being here. Oh my, um, it has been a big week. It's been a big week launching this one and launching my youngest out into the world that I wrote in very, I wrote this in very small windows while she napped. Thank you, Claire, for napping. I can hear her something around upstairs. Um, and I am so delighted that you are all here today to uh, join, join me in, in launching this into the world. It's such a surreal experience to have this book not in these four walls. Um, and it really delights me to no end. So thank you all so much. I am so delighted to welcome Danny Kind. She, I, she is uh, an actor. She's uh, spent the last six years on the two-time nom Emmy-nominated show Working Moms and Winona Earp, of which have a million huge followers. Uh, and she was recently nominated uh, for a Canadian Screen Award for the Best Lead Actress in a Comedy alongside Catherine O'Hara. That is correct. Danny Kind is a dear friend of mine. She, I met her backstage at a theater. She was wearing this huge crinoline. She was fabulous as always. Uh, and she immediately, I knew that she was one of the warmest, most generous and supportive people. And she has continued to be, prove to be that person for me. Uh, I'm so delighted that she's going to be reading from the book. Unfortunately, she is still on set, uh, still shooting, like literally right now. She just texted me. She's like, I'm so Still shooting uh, season six of Working Moms, which will be airing soon, maybe, not sure. Um, it'll be airing at some point soon. Uh, so she is reading uh, from the book for us in a pre-taped uh, recording. She's reading from the beginning part of the book um, where Grace, the main character, is tasked with transcribing letters from Amelia Earhart to her lover, Jean Vidal. Uh, and she is, uh, uh, and she's sort of in the Rare Book Library sort of doing this transcription process. So that is what Danny will be reading for us tonight. Thank you again. very excited to do this. I love my friend and I love her book. Okay. <laughs> she flips through the letters she's read and finds a few she hasn't. There are three more complaining about the lecture circuit and another short one about changing Saturday plans to Sunday. 
And then Grace finds one about Toronto. She scans the first line again in case she's misread the looping handwriting. But no, it definitely says Toronto. She feels a hum behind her breastbone the way it does when someone famous has a tie to the city. Dear Jean, I had a really vivid dream last night, but all I can remember now is that I was in Toronto. Have you been? I'm guessing probably not. Paige went to school there for a while and I was there in 1917 for a couple of years. It wasn't the best time to visit. That's an understatement. There were, they were deep into the war with soldiers training and heading overseas and coming back wounded, if at all. The war was barely an idea in Boston, but it was in full swing in Canada. Some parts of being there were horrific. Some parts I still cannot bear to remember. Oh, the screaming, howling, the pain, the nightmares the soldiers had. They still haunt me. But there were lovely parts too. Strange how that works, isn't it? It was frightfully cold that first winter, but the skating was wonderful. I had a bow up there. Was he really a bow? I don't know. We didn't talk much about it. It was too strange to talk about love when we were surrounded by so much horror. And he took me to hockey games, which were marvelous. It's where I first saw a plane. I know much has been said about that red plane I saw during the exhibition. The red plane that, what did I write in the fun of it? Whispered in my ear as it dove for the crowds, then pulled up. There are a bunch of those formative moments that people, journalists, etc., want to hang on to. Like the roller coaster Paige and I built in our backyard in Atchison. They like to say that the feeling of flying on that rickety apple box sent me on my course forever. And it's not to say it wasn't fun, but we also built a carousel that summer and put together the bleached out bones of cow skeleton and built a lean-to out of branches and moss that I tried to sleep in overnight. So yes, I built that roller coaster, but it's in the story because it fits the narrative. Maybe if I were a doctor, the cow skeleton would be the childhood story everyone would tell. Or if I joined the circus, the carousel one. But that red plane in Toronto really did speak to me. It wasn't easy to get to, but after that, with any free time I had, I'd go up to the airfield north of the city. They wouldn't let me in the plane, of course, but it just felt good to be around them. Their hum and roar, the spinning propellers, how the pilots would swing their legs up and over to get into the cockpit. I hadn't done it yet, but I knew exactly how it would feel to scramble up a wing, to spin a prop, to swing my leg up and over. All this to say, I realized this morning that I wanted to go back. I want to see it without the hospitals and soldiers with missing limbs. I want to wander through the university campus without the tents set up for the Air Force. I want to wander by the lake. It's on a lake, did you know that? I had no idea until I had been there for a few months. It's strange, isn't it? All the places we keep close, even though it's been years sometimes since we've been there. Love, A.E. Toronto. This is where Amelia fell in love with flying. This is where it all started. Grace flushes with a combination of excitement and pride, and she can't believe she hadn't thought to look it up before. She Googles Amelia Earhart plus Toronto plus hospital and finds a photo of Amelia dressed up in a nurse's aide. She scrolls down and discovers the hospital Amelia worked at is just south of the library. Grace locks up the letters and walks into the early September heat without telling anyone where she's going. Toronto. She was here. Amelia was here, walking on these very same sidewalks. Grace walks west on Harvard, then south to the building that splits Spadina Avenue like a rock in a river. This was Amelia's Toronto, except instead of nervous first-year engineers painted purple following a guy with a trumpet and the smell of 7-Eleven hot dogs, there were first world so worst, there were first World War soldiers who hadn't mastered walking with crutches or the turn of a wheelchair wheel. The imposing Gothic building isn't a hospital anymore. It hasn't been for years. It's been under construction forever. The ivy stripped off the brick now encircled in a chain link, link fence. 
According to the sign tied to the fence, it's going to house the architecture department when they're done with it. Grace stands in front of the fence and watches a digger claw the ground. This is where Amelia worked, 10 to 12 hour shifts according to Google. Grace knows it's crazy, but down there, but down here, even with the bulldozers and the excavators, Amelia feels close by, like she could run into her on the sidewalk or maybe see her turning down Wilcox Street, her long strides, her swinging arms. Congratulations, Lindsay. This is so beautiful. <laughs>Thank you so much, Danny, for that wonderful reading. I think we're all, are we all, am I alone here? I think we're all picturing that exact intersection right now in Toronto and those streets. And I mean, I don't know if I'm alone, but I'm smelling the 7-Eleven hot dogs and I'm not mad at it. So thank you. Next up, I'd like to introduce Angela Antle, who will be interviewing Lindsay tonight. Uh, Angela Antle writes for, writes and produces CBC Radio and TV, do, TV documentaries, and she's chair of the St. John's International Women's Film Festival. Her work has been recognized by the Gabrielle, Gracie Allen, and Atlantic Journalism Awards. She directed the documentary Gander's Ripple Effect, How a Small Town's Kindness Opened on Broadway, and wrote the feature-length documentary Atlantic, What Lies Beneath, which won awards at the Dublin, Chagrin, Nickel, and Wexford Film Festivals, and was screened worldwide, including at the Berlin Film Festival. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Angela. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks so much. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, Letters to Amelia is such a beautiful book, a novel of soaring connections as two women take flight to find themselves. And it's such a privilege to be part of Lindsay Zier Vogel's book launch. Congratulations, my dear. Thank or you ducky. so much. <laughs> I'm ducky. <laughs> as the Newfoundland representative here, I should be calling you ducky. Uh, <laughs> I want to know who got you started on letter writing. Oh my goodness, my grandmother. My grandmother, my Nana Ruth, these are her earrings. This is her necklace. Here is her bracelet. Um, so we wrote letters. Uh, well, after she died, I got a binder of every letter I'd ever written her. And th they literally dated back before I could write letter, like form letters. They would just be scribbles. And then my mom would transcribe whatever I had said up to like, oh, see, now I'm gonna start crying. Uh, up until you know right before she died we would write and we she only lived in oshawa i live in toronto that's like in less than an hour drive i saw her almost every weekend for my entire childhood but we still wrote each other letters she would send me um my horoscope whenever it was you know very important so i'd get it you know like four days later but it would be very important that i got it was always on a on a pink post-it note so we wrote letters back and forth all the time uh, so that's that's who got me started writing letters that's where it all started yep and, uh, you know, we just had the Met Gala last night, so I do have to ask you about your outfit. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, it is, it's a flight suit from Horses Atelier, which is, it is the most remarkable thing I've ever put on my body. Um, I have wanted one forever. And then when I found out that this book was getting published, and then when we had the launch date, I thought it's time to pull the trigger. And it was just and, and it was the pandemic, so I couldn't go try it on. I have a very long torso, flight suit. One-piece suits don't always work for my body. I needed Amelia to design me one. She also had a long torso. Uh, and then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to buy it on the internet. And if it doesn't fit, I will sort that out later. And it fit. And there's a very special pin on your flight suit. There is. I'm not sure whether you can see it. Oh, let's see. Uh, so this is my grandfather's RCAF, um, his wings that he gave me before he died. That's so sweet. So you were destined to write, <laughs> obviously. You know, it's funny. So my dad was deep into air. So my, both my grandfathers uh, were deep into flying. So one was a navigator. One was a, he, he was a flight instructor during the first world, uh, sorry, second world war. Uh, and my dad was just flight obsessed. Always has been. We got aviation week literally every week coming to our house. Uh, he took me to every air force base in the United States on our family trips. My sister was always too small to get into them, but don't worry, I was tall enough. Um, I went to every air show. So fl planes have been very in my life for a long time. I didn't love them then at all. I hated it. I hated everything about it. Um, so when I started writing 
a book about Amelia Hurt, my dad was delighted. And it is actually very helpful when you say, hey, quick dad, um, if you know, flying to Saskatchewan, what's what's my altitude like? And he'd be like, well, which direction are you flying from? And both like, and so it was always really amazing to just like, all of a sudden it made sense to have a dad that was so into flying, <laughs> very helpful. Do you remember when you became obsessed with Amelia Earhart? Like, I what do, I do. So I was, I found a book. I have it over there. It's a terrible, terrible biography. It's badly written. Um, but I found it in the remainder bin at Pages on Queen Street, for anyone that remembers Pages on Queen Street, uh, Queen and John. Uh, and it was right between Christmas and New Year's, you know, that weird lull where everything's like on crazy sale. So it was like $3 or something. And I got this book and I just, you know, was flipping through the, I mean, she's a beautiful woman. I was really taken by the photo of her on the front. And as I was reading it, I was so taken with the fact that I didn't know anything about her, A, you know, the only thing I knew about her was that she disappeared. And then all of the th parts of her life that I didn't know, again, terribly written book, but it really opened me up to how many parts of her life just really weren't talked about. Um, so I wrote a really bad novel in verse about her. <laughs> That will never see the light of day. And so that's when I really just started really being interested in, in the parts of her life that, you know, aren't her disappearing. Okay, so let's start about, let's, let's talk a little bit about process because uh, it's taken you a while to write this novel. Yes. I'm currently writing a novel and I'm totally humbled by how, by the <laughs> ridiculous questions I've asked authors for my entire career not having any idea how long it takes. So you started with that project that will never see the light of day, but yes. obviously that was a kind of development process for this. Definitely, definitely. And then, so, you know, I wrote it over one summer because, you know, I was 23 and obviously you just write a book in a summer when you're 23, obviously it doesn't get published if you're me. Um, but I, and I, you know, I didn't really think about it again, didn't really think about Amelia. And then I was traveling a few years later by myself for the first time. I was in Spain. No one spoke English in my little neighborhood. I stayed in this neighborhood sort of outside of Seville. And I was really lonely, but like that good kind of lonely that I had never felt before. And I wanted to write, I mean, writing letters is how I connect with people. It always has been, but I didn't want to write, you know, to my grandmother, to my mom, even to friends. Cause I was really lonely and I felt like I shouldn't be lonely in the way that I was. I should be excited and I should be, you know, climbing up to the cathedral and all those fun things, but I was deeply lonely. And so I started writing letters to Amelia. She felt really close to me. And it, I mean, it's very low stakes when the person that you're writing to is never going to receive them and never going to write back. Right. So I felt like I had really opened I, I felt very open about being able to be very open about how I was feeling. And, um, and again, I was just sort of sitting and I wrote these and that was that a few years later, you know, something would be weird happening in my life. I remember writing them about the dump near Perry sound or something, or like some small town, Ontario. And again, every few years, I would just write a bunch of letters to Amelia because again, very low stakes. She's never written back. I don't have to be worried about how she, I'm going to be perceived. Um, and then turns out these letters were the things that kept getting published. I was writing a bunch of other stuff that was never getting published, but these letters, I mean, I don't even know what they were. Were they poems? Were they fiction? Were they nonfiction? Like, I don't even know what they were, but they were getting published. So again, nothing was really a thing. It was just these bits here and there. Um, I found out that Amelia had flown from Newfoundland on the same day that I found out that there was this grant with a deadline the next day. And I was like, oh, maybe I could go do research in Newfoundland. And again, I didn't know what the novel was going to be. I didn't have an idea of you know, character or anything. Um, but I went to Newfoundland where I met you uh, and where I got to visit the two places that Amelia flew out of, um, Trapassi and Harbor Grace. And Again, there still wasn't a novel. There was just these bits. And then when I was very pregnant with my daughter, um, I knew that I couldn't write a novel. So she said, because um, I tried to write a novel when my son was born. And of course, then he didn't sleep. So I would write in these like 15 minute chunks of like desperation. And of course, what I wrote in that time was terrible because I was writing in 15 minute chunks. And I remember when he was like six, eight months old or something I read it and I was like this is horrible like I, it's not cohesive nothing makes sense because of course it, it was written you know a novel was written in these like fragmented terrible moments and I was not in a good place but when I was pregnant with Claire I thought wait a second I can write in like 15 minute 
maybe half or maybe 45 minute chunks, you know, because Alice Monroe said like, right when the baby naps. And I was like, okay, I can. Turns out I can't. But I was like, I could maybe write a letter in 45 minutes, half an hour. So that's when I was like, oh, this, pro may the letters, all of those letters that I've been writing, all that Newfoundland research that I had done, maybe this could be something that I work on when my baby's little. And it turns out I could A, do that and B, Claire napped a lot. So then I could write a book. So that's sort of how I, <laughs> how I took all of these little pieces along the way. And it was helpful because I had a lot of material. A lot of the material didn't make it into the book, to be honest, um, but it really laid the groundwork for what the novel ended up being. I think that's going to resonate with a lot of women. <laughs> <laughs> who are trying to do creative projects, right? You have to do it in little chunks for a while. <laughs> they grow up. Angela promised me they grow up and then you can write for longer periods. And she also told me not to get a dog when you have little babies. And I've taken both of these pieces of advice to heart. <laughs> and be careful if you invite Lindsay Zierfogel to your house for supper because you might end up in a book. And I do not swear that much, nor do I drink that much wine. Maybe. <laughs> but her backyard is that fabulous. So I know that uh, Gore, that she had an affair, that Amelia had an affair, but uh, I'm almost afraid to ask this question. Are the letters real? They are not real. Great question. So everyone's been asking, a bunch of um, journalists have been calling Hazel, the publisher saying, are, those, are the letters real? I must ask, they're not real. I don't think there's any way that Amelia's estate would ever let me, <laughs> let me publish potentially scandalous letters like that. Um, it's also just a rumor that she was with Jean Vidal. Mm -hmm. um, some people say she was, some people say she wasn't. So that was like that little pocket of fiction that I got to jump into. How, you know, the, the temptation, I think when you're writing a letter uh, embedded in a project is that you do summary uh, in that process. You, you have a letter that's really summarizing what's going on. How did you get that that voice, that that sort of non-conformist free spirit of hers, just it comes through so clearly. That was the one part of the book that came easily. The rest didn't always come easily, but the Amelia letters, um, they were sort of one of the last things that happened in the book. The rest of the story had really been flushed out. And when I was working with my incredible editor, Meg Story and Hazel and Jay from Book Hug, um, we were working on, you know, how to how to make a, Amelia really come to life in a sort of bigger sort of way, mm -hmm. and so I, I, Amelia's written a bunch of books, uh, so I tried to read them. They're not great. They're in this very um, uh, formal tone that doesn't really feel very natural to me, so that was not helpful. Uh, but then, uh, uh, but Purdue University has all of her letters that you know they have uh, available, and they have them all digitized. So. I read a lot of those and, you know, to see her scrawl and to see her, you know, the letterhead that she used and to see that envelopes that she'd written on. So that, that was helpful. And then I found this collection of letters that she had written to her mom. That was the most helpful because they were really intimate. They really captured her voice. They really, and, and as soon as I started reading those letters, my own letters just like, they just poured out of me in a way that <laughs> nothing else in this book poured out of me except those letters. Uh, and I found it really easy to slip into her voice in a way that, um, that I, haven't really, I hadn't really experienced before in the book. Like it just, it felt really easy to sort of slip into that. The one thing I didn't do that she does in her letters is she uses like funny spellings, like daughter, she'd spelled like D-O-T-T-E-R and like funny, like quirky spellings. And I couldn't pull that off and feel authentic. So th that part I did not add to it because it just felt a little much. Uh, so that the letters to her mom were, were the, the key. They were, they were absolutely the key. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the trip to Newfoundland a little bit. Um, aside from my drinking, uh, <laughs> how important was it to be in a place where she flew? You know, before I went, again, I sort of, um, I didn't really think about it a lot before I went. I didn't have kids, so I could just like come up with really great ideas and then make them happen. Uh, so I hadn't really thought about how important it would be to be there. 
until I was there. I went to, so in Trapassi, which is sort of just south of St. John's, uh, Amelia uh, took off for her first transatlantic flight, but she was a passenger. So she wasn't actually allowed to fly planes because she was a woman, blah, 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 not allowed, uh, even though she very much was a pilot and could have. But that sort of set her on the course for being, you know, the Amelia Earhart that we know. Uh, they were, they were um, grounded there for two weeks, fortnight, I think that's two weeks. Yeah. Uh, because of the fog, you know, it was a pontoon plane. Um, and I, you know, I was, I was going there, they have a museum that have a, that have her, you know, curling iron, they have a bunch of things from Amelia. So I got there and because I didn't do a lot of research, the um, museum was closed for the summer because they were going to move it down the street, which made it into the book because I didn't make it into the museum. So that, that's all real. That is not fiction. Um, but it was fascinating to see, you know, you, hearing about oh you know there's you know a long water runway you know where the pontoon plane would take off from that's one thing to to hear about or to read about it's another thing to see this like very narrow you know finger of ocean that really comes straight into the town um and it was real like all of a sudden it just really opened me up to that um and then being in harbor grace where she took off for her first transatlantic solo flight which you know she after she landed with the guys that didn't let her fly, she was like, I got to do this on my own. So she, she flew out of Harbor Grace. She didn't need a water plane for that one. So she flew, you know, in a plane that had wheels. Um, and it was one of the most transcendent experiences of my life to stand at the top of that uh, airstrip. And it's, 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 it was really powerful. Right. It's a meadow. It's just great. It is. It is. And I don't know what I was expecting. Like I've been to a lot of airfields. Thank you, dad. Um, and this wasn't what I was expecting. It really is just like a big, long stretch that sort of has like a slow downward slope, you know, the oceans on one side, there's a lake on the other. And, but there was something about it that felt really powerful. I had just come, uh, you know, there's a museum nearby and, and where you can sort of watch there's a lot a lot of history that happens on the airstrip and so I just watched a bunch of videos that had you know been filmed in the 30s there and to see to be you know to see it and then to be there it was it was really powerful it was really powerful um you know to be able to walk to the hotel that she got her famous um tomato juice from and it, it, just being there was really I mean Newfoundland is really different than other parts of Canada and other parts of the world. It's a really specific space, as you know. Um, and there was something really powerful about being there, for sure. I'm gonna ask you to do a little reading, but uh, but before um, before we go that, I'm just, you said that it didn't come naturally, that that it was really difficult. Uh, what, what do you do when you get stuck? Well, I had this amazing writing group. <laughs> God bless the semi-retired hens. And so, having to write for them, having, you know, like we have a, you know, we're meeting on whatever day. And if I don't have anything to show them, then I can't get feedback on it. So that always helped me just sort of push through. Um, and I generally don't have a hard time pushing through. It's that I have a hard time writing well. <laughs> so I can always push through, but it doesn't mean I'm writing well. So things that I do to write well are swim. When I'm swimming, that sort of unlocks all of the things. I really do a lot of problem solving there. You know, when I couldn't swim because of the pandemic, I would walk a lot, which is not as great as swimming for me, but it's still uh, like I need to move my body. I trained as a dancer and I feel like a lot of my thoughts are still really connected to my body. And if I can't move my body, my, my, my thoughts don't sort of move out of me. So I, I always have to remember to move my body. Oh, that's great advice. Will you do a little reading for us? I would love to. Let's go to Newfoundland. I did want to read the section where Grace gets shit tanked with her friend, but I'm not going to read that. Um, so I'm going to read the section. It is uh, from when Grace is in Harbor Grace at the airfield. Uh, and here we go. Siri loops Grace around the city to Lady Lake Road, gravel crunching under the tires of the rental. There's no parking lot, just a patch of scrubby grass and a few half-crushed Labatt ice cans. Grace puts the car in park and grabs her raincoat. She'd expected the airfield would be paved, but no, of course it's not. It's, a long, it's long and narrow and the grass has recently been cut. There's a plaque attached to the rock at the top of the airfield. Amelia Earhart, May 30th, 1932. The grass is soft and dotted with rain and clover, purple pom-poms scattered throughout the green. Grace pulls out her phone and checks the Wikipedia page she had pulled up the night before. 
It took 14 hours and 56 minutes for Amelia to make it across the Atlantic and land in Northern Ireland. Almost 15 hours before she set her plane down in a cow field that is now part of a golf course, where the 14th hole is named Amelia's Landing. It seems impossible that you can putt on the same grass where history was made, but Grace supposes there are much stranger things happening on historical sites than golf. She stands at the top of the airfield and pictures Amelia's Vega rolling down the green. She wants to run the length of it, but is afraid someone will see her, so she just stands and stares. It starts raining, just spitting at first, and Grace shoves her phone in her pocket, but soon it's pouring, and even with her raincoat, she's soaked before she gets back to the car. She sits in the front seat and eats Pat's bologna sandwich, staring at the rain-blurred field. It feels strange to be at the exact airfield from the video in the museum, this exact stretch of land she saw in black and white not even 20 minutes ago. It's strange to see what Amelia would have seen, the same tree line, Lady Lake just across the highway, the ocean close enough to smell. Grace pictures Amelia's riding boots tied up to her knees, like the one on her statue, goggles pushed to the top of her flying hat. She wants to go back to the museum and wait until the teenager reopens it so she can watch the Vega barreling down the grass, its wings eventually catching wind. Thank I you. I want to go back so badly. You can come back anytime. Oh. <laughs> There's wine chilling in the fridge. <laughs> but are there chanterelles? I will say, yes. Angela sent me home with the biggest bag of chanterelles when I showed up. Like in Toronto, it would have been like $500 worth of mushrooms. There are chanterelles in the fridge right now. You're all invited. Um, we have some questions coming in from the audience. An excellent one, actually, after that reading. Have you ever seen Amelia's Vega in real life? Have I? I need to send you pictures. So I did. I went down to Washington, D.C. to the Smithsonian. So I had a terrible boyfriend in 2010 and he lived in D.C. And so I would visit him. He never came to visit me, but I would visit him. And uh, before I would leave, you know, he'd go to work and then I would go to the Smithsonian and I would just hang out with Amelia and her airplane because, you know, I was writing these weird letters to Amelia every now and then. Um, and, you know, being around planes feels like this strange sort of home to me. Uh, and then I, you know, finally started writing this book and was trying to figure out the ending. It took me a really long time to figure out what the ending was going to be. I went for a swim, figured out the ending and figured out that I needed to go to see her Vega in the DC in the Smithsonian. However, I had a baby who was still breastfeeding. So I had the great idea to just go down for the day because I couldn't be away from her for much longer than that. Again, in retrospect, I would have done this differently. Um, but I, you know, got on a Porter flight and really, really, really early in the morning, like the first flight out, and I went to uh, the Smithsonian for the day, and it was amazing. And I got home very late at night, uh, and it was it was that the so the the airfield and seeing her plane were some of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. I when I saw the plane, I just sobbed like just sobbing there was this poor german uh, tourist who was like oh god this woman is sobbing and i was like take my picture um those pictures will not make it ever onto the internet um but it's it's such a beautiful plane it's uh you know i've i've seen it on the like photos of it and i've you know toured the cockpit on the internet uh but there's something so different about seeing it in person it's so much bigger and smaller and you know every edge is rounded in a way that you know planes now are just like sharp edges and it's so beautiful it's such a beautiful experience I just sat under the wing for many hours until I had to run back and get my flight home was it because you were breastfeeding that you cried or was there a fragility to it that you weren't expecting what, what made you cry? I think there was something about seeing this plane that she had made history with you know that she that I had spent years writing about and thinking about and then you know so, uh, so when she did the the flight she almost died like the the engine was on fire at one point the wings had iced over so she was you know going between and it was really snowy and foggy so she was going from you know these like clouds filled with ice and then you know then the wings would get all icy so she'd fly down but then you know her altimeter was broken so she didn't know how close she was to the ocean and it was just such a harrowing flight and to know that this was the plane like it doesn't look like a plane that can cross an ocean it looks like you know a wagon that you build with your kids like it does it doesn't look like a plane um and to know that she you know that was such a huge defining moment for her life and for you know aviation like it was it's it's such an important piece of history 
and it's beautiful. It's red and it has like these gold stripes. It is, it is one of the most beautiful planes I've ever seen. It is a lovely ending. You did a good job with that swim. Um, here's a great question from the audience that I wish I could take credit for. Uh, Amelia posits, is courage the absence of fear or is fear part of courage? So Lindsay, how would you answer this question? Okay, one more time. I know that she wrote this. I wrote it in my book, but say one more time. Grace couldn't answer this question, but and it's a question that Amelia posits, is courage the absence of fear or is fear part of courage? Fear is part of courage. That is what I tell my kids every day. Fear is definitely part of courage. Um, what I tell my kids who are listening upstairs, I can hear them thumping, um, <laughs> is that courage is when your insides and your outsides meet up, right? So you can still feel fear, but if your insides say, yes, I still want to do this, and your outside say, yes, I want to do this, then that is courage. But if your insides say, no, I, want to, I don't want to do this, and your outside say, no, I don't want to do this, then that is also courage. It is also courage to say no. Mm. Good advice. Um, what was the most interesting or surprising thing you learned about Amelia? Oh, oh I love this question. question. Great question. Um, I love that she was, she started a clothing line. So, <laughs> you know, we think of her as this pilot, uh, but she couldn't find clothes that she could wear, you know, to like swing her leg up over a cockpit. And because, uh, you know, women in the 20s, in the late teens, I guess, you know, weren't really supposed to be wearing pants. Um, and so she was like, that's it. I'm tired of this. So she sewed, uh, you know, pants that were sort of wide legs so she could really have some range of movement out of the canvas from um, wings that they would make wings out of. She would sew blouses with extra long tails so they could tuck in uh, out of parachute silk and she'd use, you know, like cotter pins and different sort of um, plain, paraphernalia as bolts and uh, as buttons and stuff. I just, I just love that about her. What I would give for some Amelia her clothes. They don't oh, exist. I'm sure I've looked. I've looked on eBay. <laughs> Do you have a favorite Amelia conspiracy? Oh, I hate the conspiracy theories. I didn't even want to write them in the book, but I had to. Um, I love thinking about her life. I find it really distressing to think about how she disappeared. Um, like really distressing. I think that most likely after she did her circumnavigation of the globe and, you know, she disappeared between New Guinea and this tiny speck of an island between New Guinea and uh, Hawaii, she probably just crashed into the ocean. Um, but there's some amazing conspiracy theories, like they are wild. They are just, I mean, I love the one that she uh, became a housewife in New Jersey. I think that that is like, Anyone who knows like this much about Amelia Earhart is like, no, she didn't do that. There's no way. There's no way she became Betty Draper. Like no, zero chance. Um, so that one I like. She would have stood out at the school gates. <laughs> yeah, totally. She was just waiting for kindergarten pickup. She was just lined up, you know? No, that was not Amelia. This is not a listener. This is not a viewer question, but one of mine. Did you ever dream about Amelia while you were writing this book? I have very vivid dreams, but I don't think I did. I, my dreams are much more pedestrian. I wish that I did. <laughs> They're like, you know, like daycare pickup, except I'm, you know, wearing something weird or something boring like that. In your book, when Grace uh, starts to write to Amelia, what does that represent for her character? Great question. I think, so when Grace, this is not a spoiler, it's on the back of the book. I promise it's not a spoiler. Um, Grace becomes pregnant. And I think it is when, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a big turning point, I think, I mean, for Grace as she's pregnant and for Grace's relationship with Amelia, where, you know, for the first little bit, she's really grieving uh, this loss of a relationship and she's heartbroken and she really doesn't care about Amelia to begin with. You know, she's, she's tasked with this job of recording, transcribing these letters, and it's really just a job. Um, but she starts becoming more and more invested in Amelia's story and starts to get to know her. And I do think that you can get to know people through the written word, through that way of connecting. Um, and finally, she feels that it's that tipping point where she feels connected enough to her to, to have that sort of exchange. And she's trying to figure out, like, what the heck is she going to do with her life? Right. right. And she's looking for guidance. She's looking for guidance. And again, you know, like I did, I mean, I, was, I wasn't writing to Amelia about maybe important things like that. But there is something that's, you know, to be really vulnerable with someone 
Um, and Grace isn't very vulnerable with a lot of people. And to be able to be vulnerable with someone when the stakes are low like that, like she can really open herself up to that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the viewers wants to know what was the most challenging part of the writing process for you? Plot. I'm the worst. Plot is the worst. My hen, my writing um, compatriot, Terry and I were talking about this yesterday. It's like, we have like ideas and themes and why does it have to, why does anything have to happen? But turns out things have to happen. Um, that, you know, tension and plot is the hardest part for me and probably always will be. Okay. <laughs> if anyone has any tips, just <laughs> pop them in the chat. We'll get to them. What is your research process like? Oh, um, not as rigorous as it probably should be. Um, so when I was very pregnant with Claire and I, I would just, uh, this is when I was like, oh, I'm pregnant. I can write in these small windows. She came um, three weeks early. So I had this great plan to, you know, collate everything and have, a, of course she showed up early because welcome to being a parent. Um, but I would just literally type in like, Amelia Earhart plus shoes into Google and just see what came up. Or like Amelia Earhart haircut. P.S. If you look up that, there is the best photo. It's of her in Miami getting her haircut by this barber. There's another one of her getting her haircut by this um, cowboy in Wyoming. Those are the two best photos of her. Um, but I would really just like Google random things as I was generating material. I mean, eventually I had to, you know, put together a thing that made sense. So then I would have to, you know, actually research, you know, what happened to her in Toronto. And I would use her, you know, the internet has a million different things about her. So it's not hard to find information about her. Um, there are, you know, some Toronto Star articles, the letters that she wrote to her mom were hugely helpful, like in terms of talking about like her boyfriend's name when she was in Toronto which is Ken. And like, you know, little details like that, uh, I got from, you know, direct sources, but a lot of the sort of like bigger picture stuff, I, I, I would just Google it. This is a great question. Has your experience writing letters that now constitute part of the novel affected how you write letters and emails to living people in your everyday life? Great question. So I have one friend named Emily who lives out West and we only communicate through letters. Oh, that's so nice. So, I know. I mean, it's kind of strange sometimes because letters take a long time to, especially across the country. Um, and especially when you like forget to write back, then there becomes like an extra long time. Um, I mean, I feel like in the last little bit, I've written fewer letters than I ever have done because I've been dealing with these letters. <laughs> so that has maybe like negatively impacted my letter writing. Um, but generally speaking, I, I feel like it really, it's really reminded me how I, like whenever I'm stuck, this is also like when I can't swim, um, I write letters. If I write letters to someone, especially my friend Emily, she's also a writer. Uh, I write to her about what I'm struggling with. And I write to her about sort of like the sort of knots that I'm untying in my brain. And like with swimming, I can really unravel that and sort of figure it out um, as I'm writing. Like there's something about that process that's so, it's like a problem solving process for me, for sure. Another viewer wants to know if you'll keep writing to Amelia after this book. Oh, you know what? On her on the pub date last Tuesday. Oh, em Emily's here in the chat. Hi, Emily. Um, I wrote a letter to Amelia. I haven't written a letter to Amelia in years, like one from me, years, years and years. And on the publishing date last Tuesday, I went down to the lake where Amelia fell in love with flying on the shores of Toronto. Uh, and I wrote her a letter and I... I say I'm gonna start crying thinking about it. Like I sobbed. Like I was like, not like few like beautiful tears streaming down my cheeks, like hysterical, like heaving, sobbing, like children playing around me. Like, <gasps> um, and I wrote her a letter about this book and how it's how it how it is in my life. So yes, apparently I will. I don't think I'm, it's like it's funny because it's like a reflex. It's like, you know, it's it's like it's not like missing my grand. Sorry. It sounds like they mark a really important, really important points in your life. It's true. It's true. Like I remember writing, I mean, writing to her when my, when Claire was born, those letters didn't make it into the book, but again, it like, yeah, I feel like they, they sort of mark these sort of bigger parts in, in, in my life. Yeah. So yeah, I probably will. I, I get, I can never like say like what I'm going to write about or when, but, yeah, but they happen. Yeah. This is a, from a librarian. I think, did you visit the Thomas Fisher a lot when writing the book? Did I? So I did my master's at U of T and I, it was a, um, I wrote a, 
uh, okay, I started writing a novel in verse that ended up being a terrible novel uh, about a historical figure, um, Dora Maver Moore, who's a theater person based in Toronto. Yep. And so I spent a lot of time at the Fisher because all of her papers are there. So I spent a lot of time in that building. It's so beautiful. If you ever have the chance to go, it's like, just like, like stories and stories and stories of terribly, ridiculously old books sort of towering above you. It's quite extraordinary. And so um, I spent a lot of time there for, during my master's. And then when I decided that Grace was going to be a library tech at the Fisher, um, I got to hang out with John Shoesmith, who I think is here. And he took me on this amazing tour. Cause you know, when you're, when you just go to the library, you get to, you know, like show up, show your little blue card and although probably it's digital now, uh, you know, and take your pencil into the reading room. But he took me, you know, to the to the sub basement and the sub sub basement and the staff room and the offices and you know to, to see the sort of you know it's like the Wizard of Oz like pulls back the, it was so amazing to see like the machinery of how it works right like you know when you're sitting at your desk and you're like I want box 436 to come to me it just arrives uh but to actually see you know the book truck going up the elevators and down the elevators and it was amazing I it's had still a blue card says John Shoesmith there we go blue card I think mine's expired, not gonna lie. Uh, was there anything in the editing process that you really grieved? The ending, oh. there's a whole last section about Bryce's baby. Ah, um, I wondered about that. Yes, and I'm glad that it's not there. I think it's important that it ends where it ends. Um, but, it was hard to let go. I'm like, it's saved on my desktop just to have for myself for sure. Okay. But I love, I like I mean, the editing process, you know, writing is, can be so solitary. And, and when you get to work with someone who, you know, like when I had my first conversation with my editor and she's talking about this totally imagined world as if it's totally real, like it's just the most thrilling thing as a writer. Um, and so it was the best and she pushed me in really amazing ways and she challenged me in really amazing ways. And uh, it was it was one of the most exciting processes that I've had as a writer. Um, and I'm glad that the ending that I originally wrote wasn't in it, but I also still love it a little bit. Well, maybe keep it for the next project. <laughs> Don't worry, the next project has a lot of baby stuff in it, so. Were you involved in the book cover art? It's outstanding. It is outstanding. I, it is, isn't it? Let's just take a moment. Tree Abraham made this. It is a beyond. Okay, so I was asked, what colors are you thinking? And I said, definitely blues. Definitely <laughs> blues. <laughs> I don't know what else I said. I said a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and then this came back and I was like, oh, that's the one. That's, 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 that's the one. Uh, it was very clear. So I got... Um, there were three that were sent. Uh, so Hazel and Jay sent me three that we could sort of talk about, look at. And I was like, there's no contest. I don't even want to talk about the other two. They were beautiful, but they weren't this. And they, I don't know if you can see the spot gloss on this and it's embossed. It is so beautiful. I'm obsessed with it. Also look, there's a plane here. It's just in the letter. Oh, and hold on. I got to show you something else. Look at those. Look oh, at those. Yours that. doesn't have that. I know yours is coming. Don't worry. It's in the mail. Um, but yeah, the end papers. When I saw those, I legit cried. There we go. Very nice job. Uh, this will probably be our last question because it's, yeah, it's like 1025. Uh, tell us about a time that you felt like you were in the messy middle of this project and you wanted to give up. What kept you going? <laughs> I feel like I was in the messy middle for like ever <laughs> in this book. I feel like there was like a really long uh, stretch where I didn't know where, like how to, I didn't know how there could be a story out of all of this. Like I had so much material and I knew that I loved, like I knew that there was something there. Like I always knew I got this really horrible rejection from the Canada Council that oh, it was very stingy. Um, but at that point I knew, like I, I, I knew enough about the project that I knew to not take it all in. <laughs> like I had to make a filter. I mean, I cried a lot friend had to bring me flowers but like I, I knew that there was still something here that was really important um what did I do to keep going I just really believed I mean I had been working on it for so long that I I felt very like you know when you're like swimming and you're like I don't even know where I am I don't know up from down like I, I felt very in the middle of it 
Um, and I think like I started working with my hens, my writing group and hearing them give feedback, you know, um, it was all written. First of all, it was all written in only letters, which is impossible for me to write in because it's always retrospective and, you know, it's, it's all summary. So that didn't work. So shifting out of that was helpful. And then hearing um, from one of my writing group members, she was like, well, why don't you just write it in the third person? And I was like, that's a terrible idea. And then I went home and I was like, maybe a good idea, maybe the best idea. Um, so again, I feel like having that sort of outside feedback, having people to bounce ideas off of, you know, like I can text any one of my writing group members and just say, you know, quick, or like, I'm struggling with this, or this feels impossible, or, and, and to have that sort of instant connection where, you know, they know the characters, they know me, they know all that stuff was just really, really helpful. It's so important to have a writing group. Do you want to give a shout out yes. to, to them? Semi-retired hens, I love you, Terry, Julie, and Sam. Thanks for being <laughs> the best things ever in my life. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'm going to squeeze one in from Andrea Curtis. Writing about and in the voice of a well-known historical figure, did you struggle to leave behind the record and imagine your Amelia? That's a great question, Andrea. Thank you. How's it going, Andy? Um, I didn't. I think because I felt like, I'm like, I have my Amelia. It's not that Amelia. Like, I've, I haven't seen the Amelia movie, you know, the one with um, Hilary Swank. Like, I, I sort of have, like, barricaded myself from certain parts of Amelia. Um, and I, yeah, I feel like, I feel like I have my Amelia. So I, I, that part didn't feel as hard as maybe it should have. I feel like I really, um, I felt like I, before I really started sort of creating this world, I felt like I had a relationship with her that was just mine. Um, so that made it a lot easier. Yeah, great answer. Well, thank you. This is Thank you. So nice to be part of this. And thank you everyone for coming. This is just beyond my wildest dreams. Like actually, Lynn, oh, I should have brought it up. The Day the Fish Caught Me was the book I wrote in grade three. And now this, here we go. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Angela, for that wonderful interview. That was great. Uh, I have a few words of thanks coming from Jay and Hazel. But before that, Lindsay, are there any final words that you would like to say? I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone. It's the book is sold out in four indies in Toronto, which means just it's I mean, it's overwhelming and wonderful. And thank you so much. Please support your local indies. And thank you for supporting small presses in Canada. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, these final words are from Hazel and Jay. I did have wigs and costumes on standby, but we just don't have time for that right now. So I'm just going to get right to you have to use their imagination, your imagination. Jay and Hazel like to say, we would like to thank Lindsay for trusting us with her beautiful words. It's been our great pleasure to work with you on Letters to Amelia, and we are so excited for the book to meet its readers. Thank you to Danny for sharing such a wonderful reading from the book. And of course, thank you to Angela for leading such a terrific interview. I agree, it was wonderful, thank you. We'd also like to thank Alex Spears for managing the tech tonight and Rachel Gary, our new intern, second day uh, for her tech assistance tonight. Thanks so much, Rachel. And of course, thank you to Toronto Lit Up for sponsoring tonight's launch. It's been a wonderful time, y'all agree. Thank you as well to all of you for joining us uh, in this time when we're unable to gather in person. It's so meaningful to us that we can gather together like this. And we look forward to a time when we can safely gather together again in real life and have some paper planes in person. A final reminder that you can order signed copies of Letters to Amelia from our website, bookhugpress.ca, or you can purchase copies from your local independent bookseller. And I think that brings us to the end. So thank you again, everyone, for attending. We wish you all a great rest of your evening. Please be well and stay safe. And thank you, Lindsay. I love you. Well done. I love you. Thank you, Michelle, for hosting. You are the greatest. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone.